presidente Jair Bolsonaro fez um pronunciamento essa noite. Da pandemia, Bolsonaro tem realizado passeios por todos os países em meio Jair Bolsonaro still maintains its relatively minor disease. do coronavírus, o presidente é contra o isolamento social. Uma doença ser classificada pelo presidente como resfriadinho. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're watching The Listening Post, working from home. Here are the coronavirus stories, the media elements that we're looking at this week. Brazil, Bolsonaro, and the fake news contagion that colors the coverage of COVID-19. The World Health Organization took too long to get the word out on the virus, but the story is more complicated than it seems. In Pakistan, a cleric tells the media what he really thinks of them, live on the air. And a spoonful of Clorox makes your temperature go down. Your Donald Trump, the prospect of impeachment and making the medicine go down. A president at odds with his advisors and scientists over COVID-19, who has said that the virus is no worse than the flu and whose supporters accuse the news media of hyping the story. It's not the U.S. and Donald Trump, it's Brazil and Jair Bolsonaro. President Bolsonaro continues to downplay this pandemic even as the number of deaths reported in Brazil surpasses China's. Unhappy with his health minister's more conventional, cautious approach, Bolsonaro fired him. He then spoke at a protest demanding that the military intervene to get people back to work. That's an elected president talking. On the airwaves, however, two of Brazil's biggest media players, Record TV and SBT, still have his back. And whether Jair Bolsonaro is in denial or simply playing politics, they're standing by him. Our starting point this week is the capital, Brasilia. Jair Bolsonaro dedicou alguns minutos ao descumprimento das medidas de distanciamento social. It's not that Brazil doesn't do social distancing. 24 of the 27 states have those measures in place. It's just that the president doesn't do it. So Bolsonaro has been downplaying the risks of coronavirus right now. He's been saying that the media and that scientists are trying to create some sort of panic in society, exaggerating the risks. And meanwhile, he's been going out in public, not wearing a mask. <laughs> and he's going out and he's coughing a lot and he's shaking hands with uh, his supporters and, and taking pictures and selfies. And he's setting the wrong example for everybody as to what to do uh, in the times of social distancing. And so in that way, maybe he's the most irresponsible leader in the world right now. And he's also been incentivizing his followers to attack the media. To Jair Bolsonaro and his supporters, the Brazilian media have caught the COVID-19 hysteria bug, criticizing him unfairly for wanting to get people back to work come what may. Bolsonaro's never had much time for the mainstream media. When he ran for president in 2018, he was a far-right outsider who relied more on social media, specifically WhatsApp, than photo opportunities or press conferences. And it worked. He's borrowed heavily from Donald Trump's fake news playbook and taken it further. He recently mocked journalists who risked infection to do their jobs. Que eu tô errado e você tem que ficar em casa. Não estão com medo do coronavírus, não? Eu não tô com medo. Isso se parece muito this is very similar to what we've already seen during Donald Trump's election and in Britain during Brexit. Feed social media with garbage to convince a part of the population that theirs is the truth, that the traditional media are lying and worthless. Because he has an extensive network through social media, especially on Facebook, that feeds his own fake news to the people daily. There have been videos circulating around on the internet in Brazil of, of journalists, mostly global journalists, out in the street reporting. You know, they're, they're using their mask, they're trying to do social distancing, and, and people are grabbing the mics from them or not letting them talk, yelling at them, saying, you know, Globo is trash and that they're lying, and basically creating an environment of harassment so that the media can't do their job. This is absolutely inspired by Jair Bolsonaro and by his machine of digital influencers that he and his sons operate. When he attacks the media, for example, he is attacking specifically some of the biggest corporatist uh, media outlets in Brazil, specifically 
Global, the network, both television um, and, and newspaper, Folha de São Paulo and Estado de São Paulo quality newspapers in Brazil that are also very powerful institutions. Oh, você é da Folha, não quero responder para Folha. Corta o jornal. Corta o jornal. Corta o jornal. Não quero papo com Globo também. So he materializes his uh, battle against the powerful elites of Brazil by confronting uh, these media uh, outlets. The broadcast space in Brazil begins with Globo. It's the biggest player in the country and the largest media conglomerate in Latin America. Globo has always been conservative. It backed the military dictatorship that ruled Brazil from 1964 to 1985, for which the channel later apologized. In 2016, it cheered on the impeachment of leftist president Dilma Rousseff over a dubious corruption investigation. Yet compared to the far more conservative Bolsonaro and his stance on COVID-19, Globo comes off as a voice of reason. Lavar as mãos, lavar as mãos e lavar as mãos. Isso... Brazil is a country where people don't read much to get their news. Their news come mainly from either social media or television. So that gives Globo a lot of power on shaping how Brazilians will think politically. And uh, Globo has been vilified both by the left and the right on the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. It's interesting because it plays the role of the Ministry of Health. One of the principal pedidos das autoridades é o isolamento social. A gente tem batido muito nessa tecla, né? Mas algumas pessoas, infelizmente, ainda estão, digamos assim, descumprindo, né? So for a lot of people, they are redeeming themselves with that. But as soon as the political tide changes, I think Global will be once again everyone's favorite boogeyman. President Bolsonaro's principal allies on the airwaves are Record TV and SBT, two channels that have little else in common. Record is the property of Adir Macedo, the owner of a huge evangelical church. Não se preocupe com o coronavírus, porque essa é a tática, ou mais uma tática, de Satanás. Satanás trabalha com medo, com pavor. SBT is owned by a businessman, Silvio Santos, and deals in low-cost entertainment programs like reality TV. SBT is where the idea of coronavirus concentration camps came up. It was the brainchild of a presenter there. There's a news presenter on SBT named Marcon do Povo, and he went on TV and went on this long rant about how the way to solve the coronavirus crisis is to open everything up, let everybody get back to work, but take everybody who's infected and put them into a concentration camp. Não seria interessante pegar, por exemplo, o exército aeronáutico marinha montar um campo de Obviously, after he said that, there was this huge public outcry, and as a result, Marcon was, was briefly removed from TV by the owner of the network. But, you know, a few weeks later, they, were, they quickly allowed him to go back on TV after he issued a minor apology. Record and SBT have been very important for Bolsonaro's uh, platform during the pandemic. They have nationwide, nationwide reach. SBT has lots of popularity among Brazilian viewers, and Record is the TV channel of the Evangelical Church, the Universal Kingdom of God. In these two channels, Bolsonaro can reach both, say, secular, low-income Brazilians and the faithful evangelicals. In fairness, though, that's not something that started with Bolsonaro. Uh, Record and SBT have always been uh, allied to the president, whoever the president is. So the same uh, people that now endorse far-right politics of Bolsonaro also endorse center-left politics of the Workers' Party because it is convenient for them to be uh, on the president's good graces. And it's profitable. The Brazilian government spends a lot of money on television advertising. Bolsonaro has been directing that money away from channels he doesn't like to those he does. 
Back in 2017, Globo, the most watched network, got almost 50% of the government's total ad spend. When Bolsonaro took power, he cut that to about 15%. Hecor and SBT are up to about 40% each. So when Brazilian journalists say it pays to stay in the government's good books, they're not being metaphorical. The mainstream media, with some exceptions, has a loving relationship with our presidents. Most of the time, they are crucial to getting a particular president elected. So yes, there is an extreme dependency on public funding, especially at a time when the means of media production are changing radically. Newspapers and magazines are selling far less. Everybody is losing audience share to social media. So mainstream outlets are increasingly dependent on public funding. Not only are the media dependent on that funding, it's a two-way street. The public have never been more dependent on their media for factual information. And too many Brazilians in the time of coronavirus aren't getting it. That's the Bolsonaro way. We're discussing other media stories related to the coronavirus now with one of our producers, Minakshi Ravi. Mina, there was a skirmish recently in Pakistan between a cleric and journalists, and Prime Minister Imran Khan happened to be there. Tell us what happened exactly. This incident unfolded at a telethon that was aired on Pakistan's state broadcaster PTV and simulcast across channels part of a national coronavirus relief effort. Prime Minister Imran Khan was there, along with other politicians, members of the media and religious figures, one of whom was Tariq Jamil. Now, Jamil is a cleric. He is part of the Tablighi Jamaat, an Islamic missionary movement that we mentioned in our piece out of India last week. His sermons online and on television have millions of listeners. Now, at this event, he had this to say on what caused the spread of the coronavirus. <laughs> بے حیائی کی طرف چل پڑے اور نوجوان بے حیائی کی طرف چل پڑے تو اللہ کی رحمت سب سے زیادہ عذاب قوم لوت پر آیا کہ وہ بے حیائی میں ساری باؤنڈریز کراس کر گئے تھے تو اللہ تعالیٰ نے ان پر سات پانچ عذاب بھیجے پانچ And he didn't stop there, Richard. In the presence of all those media personalities that were invited to the telethon, he called them liars. ایک بہت بڑے چینل کے مالک نے مجھ سے کہا کوئی نصیحت کرے میں نے کہا چینل سے جھوٹ ختم کر دو کہا پھر چینل ختم ہو سکتا ہے جھوٹ نہیں ختم ہو سکتا مینی آف دی ٹی وی جرنلسٹ ریسپونڈیڈ ود دیئر اون براڈ کاسٹ ود اے پش بیک اگینسٹ واٹ ہی سیڈ اینڈ دی اپ رور واز سو مچ دیٹ جمیل ہیڈ ٹو کم آن ٹیلی ویژن اینڈ اپولوجائز فار بوتھ دو اسٹیٹمنٹس Now, Pakistani journalists are accustomed to getting it from all sides, from the government, from the military or intelligence establishments. Do we have any idea what provoked Jamil on this occasion? Well, many news outlets in the country have been critical of religious orders that have been reluctant to completely shut down mosques and prayer congregations during this pandemic. They've also been critical of Imran Khan's government, which has been slow to react to the coronavirus. Now, this event, bringing together members of the government, media establishment and religious figures, was an attempt to bridge some of these divides, but there's really no accounting for the perils of live TV. Okay, thanks, Mina. COVID-19 is the biggest news story that most of us have ever seen. And of all the institutions responsible for getting information out, the kind that can save lives, the World Health Organization may be the most vital. The WHO is a special agency of the United Nations, born of the recognition that since no single country can manage a global outbreak, an international body was needed that could ostensibly rise above the politics of national interests. In this pandemic, though, the WHO has fallen badly short of its mandate. Not only did it fail early on to properly vet the information coming out of China, the WHO amplified it. And that includes misinformation. Donald Trump says the WHO is China-centric. He's threatening to cut its U.S. funding. And even though Trump has good reason to search for a scapegoat, preferably one from overseas, in this case, he has a point. What if one of the most important news sources we have right now is compromised? The Listening Post's Nick Muirhead now on the World Health Organization. 
This is the headquarters of the World Health Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. It has 194 member states, operations in more than 150 locations, and its remit is in its name. As of now, there is no organization like it that has the ability to shape global news coverage. We have therefore made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. The World Health Organization has just declared that this is a pandemic. The WHO officially declared COVID-19 a pandemic. The World Health Organization has declared coronavirus a global pandemic. So when, at the onset of COVID-19, Chinese media observers noted a similarity between what the WHO was saying and official statements coming out of China, it was cause for alarm. Lawrence Gostin has worked closely with the WHO. Professor Gostin, on January 14th, the WHO repeated China's claim that there was no proof of human-to-human -human transmission of the coronavirus, a claim we now know to be false. Why do you think that happened? The WHO did um, uh, reiterate China's um, uh, reporting, um, but WHO had no independent means to assess um, the validity of Chinese reporting. Early on, China did not really allow it to have meaningful access to um, its territory uh, and to independently verify with, with journalists, scientists, and doctors on the ground. Dr. Tedros's strategy um, was to try to use smart diplomacy to coax China into greater transparency. And he had some success with that because later on, a WHO team, a small team, did go to China and they did a joint assessment report. WHO's reporting by virtue of its governance is highly dependent on um, every member country's ability uh, honesty and willingness to share data and issue notifications of epidemics within their uh, sort of country jurisdictions. Uh, its verification systems uh, can only be as good as the access they provide. The WHO has been here before. Back in 2002, Beijing suppressed information about another viral outbreak, SARS, and denied the WHO access for months. It was a different time in China. The Communist Party was experimenting with liberal reforms, temporarily loosening its censorship of the media. The Great Firewall of China was easier to circumvent, and social media was a far more open space. Chinese journalists were covering the outbreak, citizens were discussing it online, and the WHO had a much better window into the country than it does today. Prior to SARS, the WHO largely relied on, on its member states to report what was going on inside of them. So if they weren't cooperating, the WHO was essentially blind. But in the years just before SARS, the WHO um, enacted this enormous push to essentially monitor uh, media, especially through the internet. So they had a very good idea of what was going on inside through their private contact with scientists and also through monitoring Chinese message boards. So you can now look back uh, nearly 20 years and say that the early 2000s, including the SARS epidemic of 2002, was a sort of mini golden age of really quite tough investigative reporting by Chinese media, which then provided a great deal of benefit to outside foreign media and international organizations like the WHO. In a weird way, by loosening up on media, the Chinese government did itself a huge amount of favors at the time by helping to control the outbreak. It's critically uh, important to have robust um, and uh, reporting in free civil society and a free media um, for fighting a pandemic or any outbreak. Because when you have a free press, when you have whistleblowers, they can get out the word and sound an alarm about an epidemic um, far earlier than a go government can or will. And that was one of the critical deficiencies early on during COVID in China. After the WHO reportedly confronted China with its findings, Beijing came clean and the outbreak was contained. This time around, the criticism has been that the WHO acted too slowly, that out of fear of offending China, it declared COVID-19 a pandemic too late. But there's a story behind that as well. 
this is believed to be ground zero in the swine flu outbreak. H1N1, or swine flu, broke out in Mexico in 2009, and the WHO was quick to react. The World Health Organization is expected to declare the swine flu, or H1N1 virus, a pandemic this morning. The world's media hung on just about every word coming out of the WHO. However, when the outbreak tapered off with relatively low casualty rates, there was a backlash. There's growing global anger against the World Health Organization for reportedly making H1N1 pandemic bigger than it really was. So what was the criticism of WHO? Well, the criticism was it seemed that every day, nearly, Margaret Chan, who was then the director general of WHO, got up and announced a new alert level um, because the pandemic was spreading. And it was widely seen that the, that using that alert level um, really uh, uh, made the public fearful, panicked, and alarmed, um, but was unnecessary. Um, having declared a pandemic early, the WHO was criticized for a variety of things. It's claimed by a renowned German scientist that vaccine manufacturers pressured the World Health Organization into declaring a swine flu pandemic seeking to increase profits. And whether or not that was fair, I think you see the leadership becoming a bit more tentative, uh, looking at it and saying, wait, we did the thing that we were supposed to do and we got we got criticized for it. Um, we got run through the ringer in the media. And so maybe we should be more careful in the future. When the WHO declares a pandemic, not only does it risk inducing a panic, but it can also be devastating to the global economy as we are seeing today with COVID-19, which is why governments around the world will go to great lengths and in some cases great expense to control the information that gets out. China's contributions to the WHO pale in comparison to the US or the UK, but since the SARS outbreak of 2002, it has steadily increased that funding, which on the surface seems like a good thing, but money can also buy influence. It's not realized that actually tens of millions of dollars every year are coming from Beijing to the WHO and have been doing for quite some time. So I would say that when we've had WHO information going out to the world about what's happening in China, there is no doubt an element in the, in the WHO bureaucrats' minds that they have to keep their sponsors happy. The Chinese government is to be congratulated for the extraordinary measures it has taken to contain the outbreak the UN system uh, itself is, has become a place for geostrategic posturing, and uh, it's, this is happening across UN organizations. The WHO just happens to be uh, the latest one where uh, the old powers, Europe and North America, uh, is tussling with emerging powers like China for influence, uh, and particularly soft power influence um, over, over the world. Much of the criticism of WHO's handling of COVID-19 comes down to structural issues, primarily funding. In the journalism business, if a newspaper is reliant on ad revenues from the oil industry, its coverage of climate change is taken with a pinch of salt. And yet, when we tune in to the WHO, we see an impartial source of information. Even though the powers it is meant to hold to account get to determine in large part its access and its funding. Today I'm instructing my administration to halt funding of the World Health Organization while a review is conducted. It's not totally neutral. If you are seeing something coming from the WHO, it's something that its member states wanted to be released. It's something that a member state consented to be released. Um, so I think that if you really want to hold it accountable, um, you basically need to go to each individual member state and engage with journalism there, engage with criticism there. To see the full picture, you sort of have to go beyond what, what states are telling it. And finally, if your feeds look anything like mine, for weeks now, you've been seeing Americans begging their news networks to just stop with their live coverage of Donald Trump's daily coronavirus briefings. They say the misinformation is just too dangerous. The idea, for instance, of injecting bleach into your veins as a cure. But even if those networks agreed and tried to kill their live coverage, their shareholders probably wouldn't let them because the ratings are just too good. 
which will come as a relief to Randy Rainbow. He's an online musical satirist who made his name during Trump's campaign back in 2016. His latest number is in the millions of views. Just like those news networks, he has found that this president is a marketable commodity. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. When viral symptoms underlie, there are home remedies to try. You find the one that works and snap, you're safe. And every product neath your sink might be a medicine to drink. No need for tests, the president suggests. Right, and then I see the disinfectant where it knocks it out in a minute. Add a spoonful of Clorox makes your temperature go down. Your temperature go down. Temperature go down. Just a spoonful of Clorox makes your temperature go down. It's the latest COVID craze. Supposing we hit the body with whether it's ultraviolet or just very powerful light. A politician who distracts has very little time for facts. The scientists he's hired are perplexed. While Dr. Birx is about to barf and hang herself with her own scarf, he diatribes and recklessly prescribes. It sounds, it sounds interesting to me. Sounds interesting to me.